I moved from Chicago to Ogden Dunes, Indiana, for a lot of the same reasons that attract most people to this area. The beautiful sand dunes and beach along the southern tip of Lake Michigan offer incredible beauty and tranquility. After living here for a while, I discovered another attractive feature, the people who live in this unique environment. There's a real sense of community here, and its unpretentious hardy residents are a constant source of surprise to me. When the Historical Society of Ogden Dunes held its artist walk in 2009, I followed up with a series of interviews to get to know some of my most interesting neighbors a little better. Each artist not only had great work to show, but shared fascinating stories about the journey on which their creative passions had taken them. Some paint, others make creations from found objects, one weaves, and another's living environment itself is a constantly evolving creative project. I learned a lot and enjoyed the time I spent with these interesting, industrious people who all seem to thrive in this rich, natural environment. Here are just some of the artists of Ogden Dunes. I just like the calm. I like the bugs. I like the birds. It, it feels like I'm in a real Disney world, and, and I can't believe that I didn't have to pay money to drive down my own driveway and sit on the porch and listen to the birds. It's just they're really there. Uh, and I love the unpredictability of the leaves and the flowers and the trees and how they have wisps and most of my artwork is kind of like this and this and I work very quickly. I do not sketch something and then color it in. I sit and I mark out some markers, parameters, and then I just go like crazy with flowers and everything and some of my most exciting and enjoyable things I've done are big squishy flowers out of the garden. Uh, again, that was the kind of gushy squishy flowers I did, just free form. Don't sketch first, just paint. Uh, more watercolors. Now this one probably in the end, I probably did sketch that one, but then the paint and the application was done in a sort of a free manner. I want people to find things that are not particularly uh, eye-catching at first, but they have to look for the things and then they find out how wonderful are the patterns in the driftwood and how wonderful is the sunlight on the trees and on the leaves and how things overlap and I want them to find the wonders in nature and sometimes I have to capture it and show it to them to help them enjoy common surroundings a lot more than they would and this is very conducive to that kind of artwork. It's not set up, it's not commercial, it's very natural. These are some of the things I work with especially when I go out into nature. Oil pastels, water, crayons, water pencils, watercolors, uh, chalks, regular dry pastels, all kinds of pencils, charcoal sticks. I decide on one medium when I go out and bring the appropriate paper. And that's what I do. So this is the kind of stuff I whip off in about 10 minutes. This is fun. To go out on Monday night and have a model and turn her into some kind of a Dega bar scene thing. And I love it. And when everybody else is sitting around me with pencils and erasers and working on a hand. I'm dashing these things off like two and three a night. And I love, I love to do this. This is one of my favorite ones. It was uh, called uh, Attitude. And it's done in just India ink and a little bit of a charcoal pencil that smudges a little bit. It's a watercolor pencil that you put water on. And that was a 40 minute picture. And I really like that one. I'm not parting with that one at this time. Uh, this is a recent one from a life drawing situation where the artists meet on Monday night and draw from models and it just kind of turned out interesting. It just evolved. It is a watercolor collage, a couple of things pasted together, painted over, and these I drew freehand, no pencil. And I was just amazed when I got done that in 20-40 minutes I could get the expressions with crayon resist and then you slop the paint over and where you have the crayons it doesn't go. and make some darker stuff and then I cut some of the things out and I drew the things in afterwards and then I put things on top and but the, the fact that you can get a, an expression that shows I call the picture jealousy and a couple of people said yeah I can see the hatred in her face for let's say her younger sister and prettiest prettier sister but that you can get that kind of emotion with just a couple darks and lights this actually part of her face is done with crayon and then I'm and then that resists the watercolor. And this is Long Lake in the fall. And this is the kind of motion stuff I do. 
I just paint, paint, paint. You don't correct with watercolor. You just paint, 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 and then you dab, 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 and what does this need? Oh, it needs a little more blue, and you just kind of mark where you want the tree line to be, and you paint as you go. Everything I do is quick, but the thought process is not quick. The thought process is there, but they're not accidents. It's not something that just happens. I will set a photograph. I will tell my daughters, uh, my grandchildren, where to lie on the deck, put ferns between their heads, swirl their hair around, and then I will get up on the table and have somebody spot me while I uh, photograph straight down, and then I will twirl them and make a motion photograph. But the whole thing and the thought process was very deliberate. So it is both fast and slow. The thoughts are slow, and the planning is slow and deliberate, and then the work is very, very fast. But I can't work at any other speed, which is why my house has to be tan and quiet. And this is my music area. I've been a flutist since fourth grade. And this is my flute collection. Uh, these are my grandfather's ocarinas. They're clay flutes. Uh, this is a bagpipe flute that I got in Transylvania, near one of Vlad Dracula's castles. And it sounds like a bagpipe. I haven't been asked to play for too many funerals, however. <laughs> uh, but that's my collection of flutists. I have more flutists outside that we may get to. They are eight-foot brass flutists and one from the symphony store in Chicago that looks like a frog. I had a poodle flutist, but it was too tacky, so I threw that away. But I played piano since early grade school. I played flute since fourth grade professionally with the Gary Symphony. And these are all my prints that I have done over the years. These are etchings, and they're made from a zinc plate. And the one next to it is a hand-colored etching. I don't do these anymore but because they require a university-type large press. Uh, this one here is a block print, and this is of Lake Michigan, and all this is done by hand with tools, and it's made from a linoleum block print, and you sit and you carve and carve and carve, and then you print it upside down, so it's all backwards. That's hand, oh, it hurts your hand. I will still do those. I love those, and these are the tools. The etchings are beyond my capabilities now because I'm not having a press, but they are done on zinc plates, which you coat with shellac, and then you scratch. Uh, let me pick up the bigger one over here. Uh, you coat them with shellac and then scratch the design into it, and which breaks the shellac, and then you drop it and ass it carefully, and it eats away what you want to. This was etched like 18 different times, recoded, etched, recoded, until I got all the things in. Some of them were pressed in with sandpaper, but this is all handwork. I draw in the shellac. This is my collection of my visions of Europe. We took a 30-day trip on a riverboat with one suitcase, and I love that. Not to have to worry about anything, not to have fancy clothes, lots of walking every day. And I set out on this project to make what I called photo etchings, a European look of the things I saw and was going to see in Europe. And everything that I took was, it was like I was on a paid photo shoot, but it was just for my own enjoyment. And I made these look like etchings. It was all about what would fit in that five by seven frame. That's my husband. That's called Desolation. That made it into a great big show. He's actually pressing his nose against the glass. <laughs> and very hard to set up with all the drapes and the blankets to keep the sun from coming in. I had to drape myself entirely with black and cover up all the shiny stuff on my camera so I wouldn't reflect. These are my hand studies, and I just got hooked up on hands as a way to learn about my computer. What can you do with a hand to enhance it, manipulate it, to make it still arty and not just really awful? These are things from the life drawing opportunity on Monday night at the Chesterton Art Gallery, and lots of professional artists do this. And uh, some things, like I love this little ballet girl, and this was my granddaughter's. That was three minutes that I did that in. And uh, some of these poses up here were two and a half in one minute. How fast you can get the pose. This was a two and a half minute pose with my grandson. They, they knew they were posing for me. And I wanted to get the idea of them. This was a three minute dancing pose and things like that. I can always come back and make it longer, but if you need to capture the likeness of something to use later in a picture, a person isn't gonna sit there for you. So you just sketch in a hurry. 
And on the bottom, I had done these off the edge of a boat in the Caribbean, Virgin Gordon, Gorda. And people were watching me because I was using some of the colored pencils. And that's about it. Cool. I think you've seen everything. But this is beautiful light in this room. Yeah. And again, there's nobody around. And, and just my sculptures and my swings and the blowing leaves outside. Octon Dunes is a very unique community. It has rolling hills and sand dunes like nowhere else in the world, I think. It's uh, situated right on Lake Michigan. I do a lot of dunes. I have done dunes for over 30 years, maybe more, and I enjoy doing them because they are ever-changing. The wind and the sun and the, and the skies are ever-changing, and it's a disappearing scene, so we try to capture them on canvas as much as we can. I've been interested in artwork all my life. I uh, went to Catholic schools and did a lot of little artwork in the uh, early years. And then when I uh, grew up, I went into the airlines and traveled into Europe quite a bit. And after visiting all the museums and things, I had such a love for the artwork and hope that someday when I had time, I would be able to sit down and do all the things I'd like to do. So when I got married, my husband was an artist and encouraged me to take lessons, study, and to uh, start painting because it was hard for me to settle down after flying all over the world. Uh, to settle down, do nothing was not something I was gonna do. But the first painting I did, he never recognized. And we laughed about it to this day. But then I, I continued taking lessons from various teachers. Then I went to Chicago Academy of Fine Arts and Art Institute and have been painting ever since. One of the teachers in Chicago said he hadn't worked with anyone that could apply color as well as I, but I sure as heck didn't know how to draw. Once early in our, very early, when we first got married, we bought four little paintings from a man called Inebnet, and they were done with pure oil. And I took some classes from him at one particular time and loved the feeling of applying just the purity of colors. And to me, when I look around and paint, I see all this gorgeous color. Some people go out and they'll see the trees are just green and maybe blah. But what I see is all this beautiful color everywhere I go. I see things I think different than a lot of people that just look out and see a tree and it's green. But I see all that makes up this green. Color makes me happy and I think your flower gardens are so brilliant with color that I can't see painting them very dull and very pastel -y. So it's really affected my life inside my home and outside. People are afraid to use color they because they don't know how to apply it or mix it. I can mix different colors together and they come out beautifully. I particularly like the Monet colors of mixing the reds and the blues and getting just the right shade of these colors. And even though he used them softly, he used them often. And they, they are colors that are very easy to put into any type of painting. They pull it all together. So yes, I do use a lot of vibrant colors, but if you look outside of some of the flowers, they're very bright and they're very colorful and I find the sky is very colorful and everything around me, I, I see color. I haven't shown my African work very much. I don't know, maybe I've been holding on to it, but the scenes from there are just incredibly beautiful. Uh, the animals like nowhere else in the world. And when I come home, I just painted and painted and painted. This is an area called Savo in Kenya. In this particular area, you see all of this red dust and the elephants surround themselves with it when they kick up all of this dust and dirt and gives them a rich red uh, brown color. 
this particular one as he was kicking up his feet was making the dust move all around the area. Well, we have a children's book that was uh, in the process for a long time, but we didn't know how to go about it, and it's called Orphans of the Jungle. And our trips to Africa, of course, and seeing baby animals that are orphans there and being lovingly cared for by people there uh, was the subject of our book. The only difference was we had a giant orangutan to uh, mother these orphans. And we put together a book for children uh, of all ages, actually, because we made it a learning book also. We put in information on Africa that is pertinent because even in the first and second grades, they are doing studies on Africa. Everyone that has seen the book has loved the book and there are many people trying to help us to get a big publisher to put it nationwide. And we recently, in a show in Indianapolis, an international show, uh, had some somebody going to Africa, Africa that took quite a few of the books. And they would like to get the word out there. So it's a hard process, but we're trying. And the other sequel to the book is coming up, hopefully, maybe next spring. We're working on it right now. After my first wife died and I remarried, uh, Judy is my second wife. Valentine's Day was coming up and I had no idea what to get her for Valentine's Day. I play racquetball and I used to play tournament racquetball in mixed doubles. And my mixed doubles partner, she suggested that I go to her painting class and give my wife an original painting. And I told her she was out of her cotton picking mind that I couldn't make a stick drawing look like a boy and a girl. <laughs> but after a couple of weeks, she asked again, and I still hadn't figured out what to do for my wife, and I decided to try it. Well, I still have the first painting that I ever did, and since then I probably have done about 300 more. I get excited about the variety of color and trying to blend the colors together into a very harmonious piece of work where the colors match the scenery and the action for my antique things that I do, like the Acropolis or the Pillar of the Seven Maidens. I like to do it in black and white, and I like monochromatic, where I use one color and then just various shades of it. I just like a variety. I do not like to get stuck in one way of doing something. And that's why I still work with Sue in painting and I also take lessons with Robert Hoffman in order to improve my skills and I take workshops, taking workshops with Jerry Yarnell, who you've seen on TV probably, and I've uh, copied some of the technique of Wayland, who does a lot of water scenes. This is one of a castle on the Rhine uh, when we took a riverboat cruise in Germany a couple of years ago. This I have entered into the fair, I received an award, I'm very pleased with it. The lady's one comment is that I should do more with buildings. To make decisions as to what I'm going to paint, uh, that's very difficult to say. I do a lot of traveling, we take a lot of pictures. And I sit down and I go through the pictures and I think, I like that. I like that scenery, or I like that, uh, I like the Acropolis that I have over here on the side. And there have been times where I've had one picture and I've made four paintings out of it because I've taken each little corner and blew it up and made that into a painting. This particular painting was out of an old log house in the Tetons. And uh, a little bit of the Tetons in the background over there and the greenery and the the arid look is what I was trying to create, how dry it was in that area. And um, this is a painting that doesn't get out of the house because it's my wife's walking over there. And so she claims it as her own and she can have it. <laughs> this particular painting is of a Norwegian fjord, of a farm in the Norwegian fjord area. So it was sent to us by a good friend of my wife's who had just gotten back from that trip, in fact her cousin, 
And um, this is a painting I've done for her, and she will receive this eventually when they come to visit. And they live in Minnesota, so whenever they get here, they will have a painting. I still look at my work, and sometimes I find it difficult to believe that I'm the one that's doing it. Because for a person who couldn't do a stick drawing, who was horrible in art class and when he was in school, and to look at the work that I'm doing now, I'm, I'm amazed in my own <laughs> accomplishments because I, I, I don't expect to do as well because of my past, but I just, I love doing it. My journey to become an artist started when I was um, probably four or five, and my mother was a home ec teacher and a very strong-willed mother. And she had my sister and I on our sewing machine when we were four and five, and she started us out on lined paper so that we'd learn how to control the machine and go straight. And then she actually ripped up old bed sheets, and then she taught us how to hem on those old bed sheets. But it also, my, my parents and actually uh, my grandparents on both sides were not people to go out and just buy things. I mean, there was, there was always a creation process in going to the rummage sales, going to the flea markets, uh, making this into that. And so like in my home now, I realize I'm just such a product of my childhood. I, I, don't, I can't think of one piece that I've actually gone out and purchased. It's all come by ways of family or friends or going to estate sales or just haunting the junk stores and then making it, turning it into something else. Throughout the house, there's a number of hutches that uh, my mentor friend, Dorothy Ives, who was also an artist out here, she and I would rebuild these hutches. Actually, we would do it at five, four o'clock in the morning before I'd go to teach, and she would come over to my garage, and we, I had my saw, and we would just rebuild all these different pieces and parts of these hutches, and then we would paint them. And so uh, I have quite a collection of painted hutches that we've done this to. But not only that, I mean, just the, the furniture in general, if um, I feel, felt something needed to be changed, uh, I guess I got that from my mother and my grandmothers, that we, we just did it. There was nothing you couldn't do. When one of the times that we were over in LaPorte going into one of the junk stores, just by chance a farmer came in with several old hutches that had been out in the barns and they were in terrible shape. Most of the bottoms had the, the feet rotted off from moisture and they were not great. Like this was basically just a very rectangular old hutch. It was not an expensive thing, just wobbly. And so with Dorothy's um, encouragement, we added this top piece to it and then um, put the design on it. But once again, sprayed it all gold and then sanded it off and then painted it green and then just did these layers of paint and sanding. Dorothy was a ceramic artist and as I mentioned, she was also a wonderful painter of, of paintings and furniture. And this was one of her ceramic busts. And the first time I saw it, I could not believe that she covered the eyes because that was what we were always told was the most important part of any type of a bust or sculpture of a person's face. And her point was she covered the eyes because she felt that the eyes took away from the entire piece, which, oh my gosh, that was like such an enlightened idea for me or concept that forget all that stuff that I've been taught for years and years. And I think the impact of this piece is just marvelous. I love it. This was another Dorothy inspiration. She loved black and white checks and she had just shown me how to do these wavy checks. And also I had found this hutch, it didn't have a top and one of the legs was missing. And so of course we just got a board. And, but proportionally she was the one that really taught me how to get the proportions right on furniture. And the leg, because I couldn't find another leg exactly like this, I just built it out of Durham and drywall screws and sanded it down. So I actually sculpted that leg down there. But once again, that goes back to my mother and my grandmother. You just make it work. You just do it. This was a collage I made when I was a freshman at Purdue. And um, this was another time that I, when I was doing this, I never thought of myself as an artist at all. But something that happened after I turned it in to the professor was that the professor actually tried to use it in his personal show and he was caught of course <laughs> but that was the first aha moment I had that oh my gosh you know he, he really liked my artwork it never occurred to me that this would be anything other than just something else that I made um, the, the title I don't title very many of my things but it's called past conversations these are curtains that my mother printed when she was in college in her applied arts class is what it was called. And once again, she never thought of herself as an artist, but I think that these are timeless in design. Um, it's just such a great modern repeat pattern. And because they didn't have all the uh, 
different things that have been developed now. She actually hand sewed all these little circles on. Those are all pieces of yarn that she hand sewed on and then also hand sewed on these trim pieces just to create her, her effect. She never hung them in her house. These are the clothes that my partner and I uh, made and produced and then sold through the apparel centers for a couple of years. Uh, what we did is, is start with black velveteen and then with a bleaching process, we lift the dyes out to create the patterns in the fabric. So this particular coat has gone through all the pattern pieces being laid out on a table and then I have templates I lay on the fabric and then I have different strengths of diluted bleach that I spray through them to create um, like this part right here probably went through the bleaching cycle or this part right here went through the bleaching cycle three or four times. Um, something that's more of a shadow probably was, was covered up and only went through maybe once. Um, after each time that I laid these pieces out on the table, they, it has to be machine washed and then in a hot dryer to fluff it up again. And then the pieces would be ironed and put back out on the table and the templates would be replaced and then different strengths of bleach would be sprayed on again. Some of the things that we found out when we started this is that we thought black velveteen was obviously dyed by black dye. Well, what we found out was that sometimes black velveteen is dyed by the darkest brown, so it looks black. So when we bleached it, this actually started black, but when we bleached it, it turned brown. Um, I don't know that I have any examples right now, but we've had, we found, um, when we bleached it out, we got pinks, we've gotten blues, we've gotten greens, but once again, I'm sure most of the velveteen that we ended up getting when we were in production was from China, that whatever dye was the cheapest at the time is what they would use. But we never knew until we actually started dyeing it. And probably one of our biggest lessons was when we finally found our manufacturer um, to start just sewing the coats for us, he called us and said, you know you have different blacks here? And we thought, okay, I mean, you know, different lots, it's okay. So anyway, he sewed the coats and had the pockets and the sleeves. And when we bleached them, we had like one pink sleeve, a yellow pocket, a green front, a blue front. I mean, it looked like a clown outfit. So we had to, we, what we had to do was take them apart and match up the sleeves and the arms. And then we had to re-bleach and we got really good with bleach pens <laughs> to, to uh, get those so that we could actually sell them. These ties came from my parents' apartment building that they owned for most of their married life. Um, it was an old building in Glen Park, and it seemed like any time a tenant moved out, they would leave ties in the closet. And so my mom, who was always collecting and saving things for the new creative idea, um, just had them. And so I, it was always, I just felt I needed to use them because it was such a quantity that, that just to be able to develop something with it. I call it gravy stains. I feel like my whole life has been inspirational, and, so, and it seems um, that that the people that I'm attracted to are inspirational to me and because I have this thing that everybody's an artist even if they feel like they're not like this last summer with my sister and her her best friend came over who feels she's not an artist and both of them just were in their own way affected what the outcome of the garments were or whatever it was we were doing at the time but um, I know that all my friends, my closest friends, all turn out to be project people. Like we always get together, sort of like the old quilting circle. We're always doing some type of project, even if it's washing windows. We're still all doing it together. And, and it's just, everybody's brainstorming to a certain extent. And um, I find that most of my friends are resourceful with found objects and what to do with it and how to, how to make it into something else. But uh, my whole life has been a collection of experiences like that. Designing uh, is probably my forte. If I uh, have anyone come up to me and say, uh, John, uh, could you do this or can you make this? And the answer is absolutely. It's just, uh, I just have to figure it out. I have to figure out how to do it. And once I figure that out, then getting into it and seeing it come to life, that's whether it be painting, whether it be drawing, whether it be designing a, uh, a new deck. All these things are just inspirational and I, I, I just can't wait to get back to them. And so it's, it's the beginning process, it's the problem solving, it's the designing, and it's the continuation. And when it's done, you can appreciate it, but I can't wait to get to the next project. We were living in a small apartment and we were looking for a house. And every spring we would go out and 
I looked for a house and all the houses to me started to look the same. And eventually we found this place, which wasn't on the market, but uh, someone said that someone said that they may be selling. And so we came over and as soon as I walked up to the front door, I looked through the house, through the living room, and saw a sweeping dune on a beautiful day. And I told Joan, I says, this is where I have to live. And this is kind of like a uh, canopy walk, especially in the summertime. All these leaves just grow over the top. And as you see, when we get here, there's a path that starts turning. These are Canal Street bricks. Each of these bricks probably weighs anywhere from 20 to 35 pounds. As you come along this way, this is where I kind of had a great feeling for this house as I looked through and I was able to see that sweeping dune on the other side. I said, this is the place I have to live. Frederick Collins, the architect, the original architect, uh, designed this house and started began building in 1947. Incidentally, 1947 is the year Joan and I were born. My wife and I were born, so I guess he built the house for us. All this area has been somewhat expanded. Flagstone, patio, looking up this way. The drop feels like a about a hundred foot drop, but it's actually goes down maybe about 12 or 14 feet. We're gonna go around the west side of the house, follow this flagstone path. All this is new flagstone trimmed with cobblestone. We uh, live in this house that is probably 75% windows. No matter where I am, I look out and I see the dunes, I see the weather, whether it's uh, winter, spring, summer, fall, you always feel like you're a part of the outside or the outside's a part of you. When I designed this, there was a smaller uh, add-on room that probably didn't look like the house. It looked like an add-on room, kind of a porch, give you a porch effect. And just expanding this, uh, making the doors go off uh, both sides like that, it gave us an idea of making a little patio outside there. Here's a uh, chess set that I did years ago. It's made out of spools and uh, tinker toys. And so, since I'm a chess player, I just decided to uh, feature the chess set here. There's a couple of old chairs that came out of uh, my father-in-law's uh, law office. Coming this way, we have our, uh, our Buddha sitting here that kind of keeps us company and our and Joan's uh, aloe vera plants from upstairs. This was the original kitchen. The kitchen had a sink on this side and it was set up with, you know, probably a small place to cook here and a small refrigerator. So we didn't need that because we built a large kitchen downstairs so I built this little bar space. And the bar space was just to have a little comfortable place where you can sit, look out, see the lake. So now we have one more feature here that I think is very unique, is this countertop right here is on wheels and we can kind of move it anywhere we want. So when we need to have a larger kitchen, we move this out and it fits right into a unique space right next to the refrigerator. This mantle is kind of unique. It, it uh, was influenced by, uh, I went to the Idle George uh, Southwestern Museum in Indianapolis and I walked through the entrance and they had a post lentil design. And that's pretty much what this is. It's a, a post and a lentil design continued. The ends right here, this was a telephone pole that was situated out in the dunes. It was, it was just uh, not being used at all. And so I cut the top end of the pole off in a certain way so I can attach wood to it. This came out of Burns Ditch. And I carried it up 
there's some driftwood that came out of the lake. So Joan and I are probably uh, considered scavengers now. That view used to be a rooftop. Then when I designed and made the great room, we decided we could make a great deck up there with a living space out there with a fireplace, a little bar on that side. So it kind of gives you a really good feeling instead of looking out at a rooftop to look out at a nice deck. Welcome to my studio. Uh, the studio has probably been here five years maybe, and I'm still working on it. It's not completely finished. Some of my uh, drawings, charcoal drawings, are on this wall. And what I did is I created a sports series, a series of uh, charcoal drawings and I had uh, lithographs made of the charcoal drawings. You see there's a uh, soccer ball, have golf, boxing gloves, baseball gloves, tennis shoes, uh, baseball shoes. This bicycle was actually my daughter's bicycle and I actually just put it up on my uh, kitchen counter when I, before I had a studio. And I found that the uh, media of charcoal like gives you a, an advantage because you get the richer, deeper tones, and then you can go all the way to the lighter tones. I do uh, charcoal and pastel portraits that I've been commissioned to do, uh, Joan's parents. But this was a uh, portrait uh, taken from two pictures of them when they were very young people. Uh, they're not with us anymore, but uh, the portrait stays with us and they, they were quite a, an attractive couple. I used to uh, teach a uh, life drawing class, so I taught people how to use pastels. And these are some of the uh, pastels that I had left from the uh, drawing classes that I was doing. Portraits, uh, actual uh, live models that uh, I worked with. On this wall we have, uh, we have watercolor, prismacolor, a photograph, and an acrylic. Uh, all of a common subject. What happened was I took a, uh, a photography class and I was shooting this train, abandoned train, and this gentleman and a friend of his were working on the train. They came out and I took a picture of them and I, I gave them a photograph of it. But eventually I took it back and I, once I took a watercolor class I had to photograph and I rendered that in watercolor. Then the next one was an acrylic uh, painting class and then the steel mills, kind of a uh, rectangular, uh, solemn, uh, still, very still, still life. My biggest influence in life is my sweet wife, Joan. I mean, without her, none of this would be anything because she's like, she's just the most fabulous person you want to meet. She just, she lives here, but she doesn't just live here. This is a part of her. She lives this. And she shares that with me, so that's like, oh, you couldn't like find anything more fun than to live with Joan in this house. Because she, she makes it all work. So I'm gonna give her probably 100% of the credit, and I get zero, okay? So that, make sure you have that in. You can be yourself in Ogden Dunes, uh, and uh, people will accept you uh, for what you are. There's a variety of people here uh, from different backgrounds, and uh, uh, that's what both of us liked. I'm actually a farm girl. Uh, I was born in uh, Croatia uh, just before World War II and in a very small village that was in the mountains not far from the sea. And uh, so, this uh, place, Ogden Dunes, appeals to me for that reason also, in that it's small town, um, bigger than my village, of course, which I have painted on the painting up there uh, from memory, but uh, uh, definitely has the same type of air, you know. Um, it's green, it has mountains, of course we don't have mountains here, but we've got the lake and we've got the trees, we've got the birds. 
I, I'm sure there is some connection there, you know, between where I hail from, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, where I ended up. I consider myself an artisan, not an artist, really, uh, which is, uh, artist is something much more pretentious than what, I'm, what I aim for. Um, that also is in, influenced by my childhood because my mother was uh, a weaver and the ladies in the village did lots of hand, handiwork or handwork uh, and to embellish their homes and uh, they, they spent lots of many hours doing it. When I was in the elementary school over there, uh, we were taught in fourth grade how to do certain things and at the age of 13 they embroidered a whole tablecloth. So uh, something I like to brag about because uh, at 13 most, most young people are not interested in that. But we had no television and we were, you know, didn't have much and so uh, that, that was the way I showed my creativity at that time. When I finished uh, uh, teaching and retired uh, and my mom had died already, uh, I decided that I would just simply go into weaving. Um, and uh, at that time I thought, well, I have four children. If I make each one of them a blanket, they'll be fine. <laughs> but once I did that, uh, made each one of them a blanket or a throw, uh, I decided, well, I have all this knowledge, and I might as well continue. What excites me the most about weaving uh, is the different colors that I can mix together to create new colors and how these colors then, when I make a garment, how these colors look on a person. Uh, so I don't go for geometric uh, formulas and patterns that much. I, I appreciate people who do it, but if they don't have the colors that I like, I still reject that type of weaving. I think that uh, if you want to be a worldly person and understand as much as possible, uh, as much as can be understood, how people lived and what made them do things that they do, you must travel. Uh, as much as I like Ogden Dunes, I, I don't see just staying in Ogden Dunes all the time. Uh, what, what I learned in other countries has enriched what I do in Ogden Dunes and uh, has made me open to many different nationalities, religions, uh, be less strict on one particular doctrine, whatever. And same is true with the, the weaving or art because uh, uh, we found out how, how women wove in, in, uh, in Cusco, for instance, in, in uh, Peru. This painting is uh, painted on glass. Uh, it is part of the uh, naive art. Uh, Croatian naive painters are really quite well known uh, around the world, not so much in the United States, but in other places they are. Naive painters have no training, and they're in the United States, the only person that's noted for that is Grandma Moses. Uh, we don't go into naive art so much, but they do in other countries. I think most of the places that are relatively poor have brighter colors of things. Uh, you see that in Africa also. When Hank went to Africa, uh, he brought back some things. They're very, very bright colors. And it's, you see it also in the movies, whatever, you know, where you see these people. Uh, they wear things just simply because it makes their life much happier. And I think uh, much brighter, you know, and so that's, that's probably why I like bright colors. I come from a poor village. <laughs> in this room I have a loom that uh, can be transported to a different place. It's a, a table loom and it's on a stand so you can actually fold it up and uh, take it with you. Uh, it is a uh, loom that has eight shafts. One, two, three, four, five, six. These are shafts and you move them up and down. This is a shaft and these levers move it up and down and this type of loom produces uh, since it has more shafts than the floor loom it produces finer um, more delicate uh, patterns this is the floor loom that has only four shafts there are four only you saw eight upstairs and they're the ones that go up and down as you weave uh, there are four of them uh, that means that you can produce quite a few different uh, types of patterns, but not as many intricate ones as you can with uh, more of these. I did have this on the loom, on this loom last Sunday when we had the art exhibit, and I had just finished it, so I took it off and I'm wearing it so you can see what the final product is like. These are samples of some things that I have made in the past, and, and as I've said before, I do sell them, so I don't have as many 
as I have had in the past, but I have blankets that I've made for my grandsons uh, and my granddaughter, and some that I've crocheted. Little pillows and lots of scarves over this way, and some placemats, some different uh, motifs and different uh, weights. These are very heavy, these are light, and ta table runners. So this is uh, what constitutes uh, uh, the wearable kind of art. Then in addition, I did uh, other things, like this is actually a cape, if you open it up, uh, out of felted wool. And this here is a stole made out of uh, alpaca in, that I bought, the yarn that I bought in Peru. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this here is a knitted uh, stole in peach. And this is a... Uh, in chenille, so I'm working with different kinds of yarns just to see how they work. And chenille is very flowy, but not so easy to work with, okay, because it gets entangled. And this is alpaca again, uh, a rebozo. This, this is a motif is found, this type of pattern is found a lot in South America because it's easy to, to make, you know. And you just put it on and it's uh, very simple. So this is in black alpaca with a scarf. And then I went into making vests, and I've made lots of vests. Women seem to like them. Uh, they're not ex as expensive for one thing, and secondly, they can wear with a variety of things at different times of the year. And a scarf that I made. And then over here um, is another rebozo and chenille, just different colors. I work with different colors, and this is more in peach and kind of taupe. Uh, that's also, you can just fold it up and take, put it in your bag and it's easy to travel with. The, these two are the latest things that I made this summer. Uh, it's from the yarn that was given to me for my 70th birthday uh, from my son and from my friends. So I made this one uh, as a jacket and then I made also a blouse that goes with it. And this one is also from the yarn those friends of mine gave me for my birthday. And again, it's just different colors. I work with colors. And it's lined with green. I made it, even made my own buttons. So that is me. And I had made a formal when I was a junior in high school. And look where the quote from the yearbook says, we have another Dior in the making. So look at me. And I have a chignon, and I have a chignon now. <laughs>we're all on this on this bus riding through life that's going like hell down the road I'm trying to get people to stop talking to each other and look out the window look out the window walk the dunes see the color don't just walk the dune and talk to your buddy take the time that you're in a special place and see what God's given I was married very young and my husband I think was my first patron um, in grad school, we got married and, and we went off to um, Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan, three days married. I was just 20 years old and um, we had an efficiency apartment. I got pregnant right away, moved to a one bedroom apartment where there was a, a great big bathroom and it was meant for students, married couples, to have a washer and dryer. Well, we were broke, we had no washer and dryer. But he did make me an easel, and it's that easel right there. Um, uh, he, and he set it up in this large bathroom, and that's where I really jumped into oil painting, in the bathroom of our married housing apartment. I moved from my drawing into watercolor washes, and then uh, finally I was pushed to more intense color and went got jumped, jumped right into oil. And that's kind of the way it is. This is my first space past the corner of the dining room table in my whole life. Um, well, no, there was the bathroom. Um, but this is my space to work and develop and have paintings in progress, which is what you'll see in this room. Things, pieces that are drying, pieces that are developing, of course, pencils were big to me. That is the basis of my uh, talent, if you will, 
and development thereof, but um, that I would teach people to A, work their eye, look at things properly, B, learn how to draw. If you learn how to draw, then you can fly. And again, if I were teaching you, and I have had students in this studio sitting at this exact table, teaching them to draw. Draw, draw, draw. It's very incredibly important. This one is newly, newly painted. I'm not sure, I don't know if you can get a good look at that. I'm not sure that I'm done with it, but my husband says, oh, Jane, you can paint on that forever. And I said, well, you're right. Now, did you, now something like this, were you there or did you do Yes, it's a a, right across uh -huh. the street. So you, you take your easel and, and set up? No, or, no, or that's, I, I did some initial sketches and um, proximities of things. I make notes on the lighting, and of course that's all um, achievable and changeable in studio. What you learn when you're really trying to extend yourself is it takes the fear out of, what takes the fear out of is it's only paint. This is a little exaggeration, but it is um, Suicide Hill. Um, and that's right across the street in the National Lakeshore. Um, it was a bright, uh, sunny morning, as you can see. And it just struck me um, that I needed to paint that. And so I have, I have attempted to do so. This, just for edification, is a gallery canvas, gallery wrap canvas. And so the painting continues and flows right around right around the corner. And this allows the, uh, con the customer to not feel the necessity of framing. This little girl's dad had a flat bottom boat and the girls were out. And, and the name of it is Girls with Pearls. You can see that they, they were all dolled up. They had their pearls on and their nail polish. It is how sweet this little town is. Um, um, and that surely is an example. Being here has allowed me personally to free my mind, free my spirit, to try different things and develop in my art. It's also helped me heal um, um, from our loss. These two paintings are of um, the son we lost. This is when he was 14. Um, reading Baseball Digest on the hood of my pickup truck. <laughs> I was living in Buffalo, New York then, um, which is one of the states you'll see on the license plate. Uh, this, is, this is my son as a grown man. He was 22 here, 14, 15 there, uh, maybe 23, 24 there, and 29 there, and that's, that's when he when he died. The last one I took, the last big adventure, was a trip to Ireland. I shipped my equipment, which there was a lot of, I self-supported, um, over to Ireland on a on steamship. Steamship, you can see how old I am. Um, by boat, which was the most, the most inexpensive way to uh, transport. This is a piece left from my Irish adventure, and uh, this is, I believe, is called Lemon Light, and you can see why. Where I was staying, uh, we were about 50 degrees higher in, in latitude uh, than this present here in Ogden Dunes in Indiana. And at eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, it was still light. I raced from my little farmhouse, my little cottage, uh, down the street. I have a portable seat. Um, and pulled up off the road, it was a little two-lane highway, and sat there and, and did sketches, and then finished this um, back at the cottage. This is a painting I did at the Irish Sea. Um, there, the subject matter is rather bland, but the colors are not. And if you look into the painting, um, you can see why I did it. Um, this is the beach, the exact beach, that Saving Private Ryan was filmed on. And this little thing is my Julian Easel, which I took to Ireland, and I took on my road trip to New England, and it I goes into the dunes occasionally. Um, it's a wonderful thing, but it's quite heavy. It's quite cumbersome. Um, 
but when you need an easel, you need an easel. I was sitting in the bleachers in, uh, at the Cara, which is a beautiful, beautiful racetrack outside of Dublin. Um, magnificent place. It's an all grass track. Uh, this is called Turf Agents, um, and Turf Agents are in the vernacular really bookies. And all of these personal interactions are are being shown because people have either bet and lost, bet and won, or they're contemplating their next wager. And the bookies are underneath the umbrellas. This is just a, an old piece of furniture that I picked up for $5 probably. And um, this room, this whole studio rec room area is, is made of, of just stuff that I'm not afraid to have used and abused but it's just my interpretation of the dunes, uh, flowers, dune grass, and it made this otherwise ugly table acceptable. That's just a figment of my imagination, but it, it, it kind of represents to me what there is to see as you walk through the dunes. The dried leaves, um, the marks, the swish marks that the grasses make in the sand. This, this one is simply called Friends, and what I tried to achieve there is just emotion. Um, and I like the nail polish and the little red thongs. I have a lot of different passions, and I think you represent passions in different ways. Um, art certainly is a way for me to express myself. I have a passion for my God. I have a passion for my husband and my family. Um, I have a strong passion for art and I have a passion for cooking. And so you will see I've done still lives that express the beauty of a, of a golly darn little vegetable and what you can do with it. And there's a piece in the other room that is of peppers and a knife. And it just is saying to you, life is good. These are beautiful things. So I'm really blessed to have so many things I'm interested in and care about. Um, Absolutely.